year was close to 1810 when that Dutchman tall and lean brought all his tools and plans with him to that valley rich and green. Throughout the narrow valley there wound a clear swift moving stream. To the Dutchman it seemed to dare that he settled with his dream. He stood upon a rise and said, Lord, it won't be long until in this valley I'll make my bed and I'll build a water mill. So he staked his claim by the stream and he worked and toiled each day. In that fertile valley his dream took root and he was there to stay. All rejoiced for the water mill, though it was the smallest they had seen, but as good as the ones o'er the hill and right for the valley green. Then one day the dark clouds gathered, and for many days and nights, hard rain and dark skies delivered, too much for the mill to fight. When the sun came out to end the flood, as far as the eye could see, wet ugliness and deep brown mud were spread across the valley. And where the mill once proudly stood, just a part of a wall was left. Here and there a piece of driftwood, booty of the water's theft. The Dutchman looked o'er the valley as wild geese flew overhead. And all his weary eyes could see were the ruins of mill and homestead. And so he left without a word with his dream within his heart. And where he went I never heard, though the valley missed his art. Mother Nature soon dried the mud and deer and wild game flourished. Bright beauty soon followed the flood the Green Valley soil was nourished. And though his mill gained little fame, and few ruins can still be seen, the Dutchman, named Schultz, left his name to the stream in Valley Green. Uh, Schultz Creek came from name from a Dutchman named Schultz, who had a mill um, on Schultz Creek, uh, downstream of, uh, of the Bryson farm. Down here on the creek, uh, on what we call the old Tom Hunt place, and uh, and so I guess that's that's where the, the creek got its name from, uh, from Mr. Schultz. And apparently that mill didn't stay in there very long. I think it was taken out with a flood just after just a year or two. As far as I'm told, the the millstones are still there. Uh, there are a few people that know where those millstones are located. They're buried there. But if you go to the very earliest maps I, that I have ever seen of Greenwich County, two streams that always show up is Schultz Creek and Tigers Creek. And Schultz flows into Tiger just at the end of what's now considered Old Schultz Road and Route 7. So Schultz has, has been identified here from the maps that I have seen. Another key figure in Schultz history was George Dorch. And that story starts with his father, William Dorch, who was wounded in the Revolutionary War Battle of Utah Springs. Uh, William was a German immigrant, and he first settled in Virginia, and then in 1810, he brought his family here to Greenwich County, Kentucky. And his son, George, would go on to have a huge impact on the settlement of the Schultz Valley. I'm very fortunate to be a sixth generation living on Bryson Farm. And uh, where that comes down from is that our, uh, I think it's three greats grandfather, George Dorch, at one time owned the entire Schultz Valley. So, you know, Dorch was the real deal as far as being the old time pioneer, early settler, you know, uh, had, to, had to be a marksman to, to survive and to, to have things to eat. Of course, he raised a, raised a large family. Evidently, George Dorch was a crack shot that he won most of the um, uh, turkey shoots at the time. He talked about the firearms that Dorch had and the fact that that he was a great shot and that he had killed, I think the way you said it, he killed his share of bear, panthers, turkey, and deer. I, I, I love to think about uh, grandfather George George because can you imagine a, a man, just a farmer, coming in and the way the surveys, I, the way I understand it, they would come in and survey Schultz Valley and they would survey to the top of the ridge and all this valley would be for sale because the farmers could use it and it would be subdivided. Well, George Dorch ended up with this whole 
lower Schultz Valley to the ridge tops, to the ridge tops. And he owned from uh, Curly Hunts down in the Smith area there, all the way to Dry Fork. And as he reared his family, he had sons, but daughters, and every one of the daughters ended up with a plot of ground. And every time a daughter would get married, he would give them a farm and a cabinet. The Bryson farm, as far as I know, is the only one of the dowry farms that is still intact. Uh, we also have the corner cabinet that was given to my great-great-grandmother. Our line of Bryson's came out of uh, Lewis County, uh, if you go back a few generations. Uh, so the, the, do the Dorch daughter that married into the Bryson family was Martha, known as Aunt Patsy. I'm not sure exactly where the Aunt Patsy came from, but she's most generally known as Aunt Patsy. Uh, she lived to be in her 90s. And uh, she and the A.H. Bryson the first were married around 1830, 34, somewhere in that range. And they had nine children. Of those nine children, only one survived past the age of 30, and that was my great-grandfather, James D. Bryson. And Martha Bryson, who inherited uh, the Bryson farm, uh, what became Bryson farm from her father, George Dorch. Their original homestead was up on the hill uh, that faces, if you walk out the front door of the store and look on that hill but beyond the ball field, that's where they lived. And they had an orchard there, which uh, there's, I've actually seen some uh, clipping out of the uh, very early portion of the times of the 1800s talking about it being a fine orchard that uh, the Brysons had out here. So that was uh, how they made their living, at least in part, was through that orchard. I've always been told that what brought them down to the valley was the, a lot of lightning strikes. But that's part of the reason that they came down to the came down to the to the valley. Uh, Martha Dorch apparently was a very colorful person. Once again, she lived to be in her 90s. She was blind by the time she was uh, in later years. My father had very clear memories of her, um, and he would say that his great grandmother always called uh, George Dorch me Pappy. She always talked about me Pappy. And uh, she uh, smoked a pipe and after she became blind. And of course, you know, he was a little kid then, four or five years old, but he thought it was so funny because she would have her pipe in her mouth and be going, where's me pipe, where's me pipe? We have a 1914 family photo that has uh, four generations of Bryson farm owners in it, which includes Martha Dorch Bryson, who by then was a widow, and her son J.D. and his wife Nan, who had raised their four children here. Uh, their daughter Nell married Walter Coleman Fields and she left home, so that means the farm passed on to J.D. and Nan's three sons. Eventually the oldest son and the youngest son both moved to Ashland and A.J. set up a medical practice and uh, A.T. practiced law in Ashland. So that left Hughes, my grandfather, right where he wanted to be, and that was here on this family farm. And that's where he and his wife Elizabeth established A.H. Bryson and Sons General Store in 1910. And they raised their two sons, Tom and Jim. Uh, Tom was a lifelong bachelor and he lived here on the farm his entire life. Meanwhile, my dad, Jim, had left home for college at UK and also for service in World War II. And then after the war, my dad came home to back to the farm and he married Gladys Hannah Bryson from nearby Malunk, Kentucky. Uh, Jim and Gladys had three children, that's my siblings, Betty and Bob and myself. And then when Hughes died in 1960, he passed the farm on to his three grandchildren, leaving my dad, Jim, as the trustee. And Jim also took over the business at that time, and he and Gladys ran the store together for the next 42 years. Uh, dad died in 2002, and after that, Mom operated the store more or less by herself, but with the help of her kids for the next 10 years of her life. Um, so now we are the third generation owners and we open just one day a week on Saturdays only. And as far as the farm heritage, uh, it continues with Bob and Linda Wadsworth Bryson's son, Joe, and Joe is the seventh generation with a, a home that he has built here on the farm. Not only was I born here on Shoals Creek, but um, my heritage is here, all the way back to George Dorch. Bryson's ha is still the original. It's been handed down all along, but uh, our farm 
was not handed down directly from George Dorch, but it was a dowry farm. And my grandmother, who through marriage wound up living on it, um, was a descendant of George Dorch. So my grandmother, Mandy McDowell, uh, was a Spriggs, and her daddy, his name was Ben Spriggs, and he was the son of uh, Eliza Jane Dorch Spriggs. Um, kind of uh, a roundabout way, we are on a dowry farm and we are a descendant of George Dorch, so I'm where I'm supposed to be. George Smith, George, my name George Smith, married my grand, great great grandmother and they begat Albert and Basil. Grandfather Albert Smith married to Rebecca Jane Major, uh, moved out here on this farm, and then uh, Albert and Rebecca begat my father. So it's five generations. One of the things that was done around 2004 was to create a, a block for the, a quilt block for the front of the store as part of the Green County Quilt Trail. And rather than just paint a block, uh, we decided to do something dedicated to the Dorch family. When they started working on a quilt block, it's called Country Corners, and it's on the front of the store out here, and uh, Bonnie and her sister Betty pretty well put it all together, and I helped some on it. Uh, my sister Betty actually designed the quilt block that we used. It's based on a genuine quilt uh, design. So this is called the Country Corner. And each of the small squares is dead. It starts with George and Elizabeth Bob Dorch, and you go uh, clockwise around, and each block is dedicated to one of the Dorch children, and it tells which farm they inherited. So you go through around that block that's on the front of the store. If you remember the Dorch family, you can see which farm uh, that your, your line inherited and, and the name of the farm, who that, who that Dorch uh, daughter married, the dates, the dates of death, everything that we could put on there we have. So it's really a nice, uh, a nice way to capture a lot of complicated history in a way because there were so many farms. George George is buried, once again, in what we call the Bryson section of the cemetery up there. Uh, the cemetery behind the store is kind of in several sections. The upper side is the Nippert side. Um, some people call it Bryson's Cemetery, some people call it Bench Chapel, and some people call it uh, Nippert. The upper part of it, actually, I think is Nippert. We decided to put a dedication to the Dippert family because they originated the cemetery in about 1872. Uh, that's when some of the first people were buried in that cemetery on their property. Uh, so I put, we put the memorial uh, uh, as Dippert Cemetery because that's where the whole family is, is buried. Uh, the, a couple of Godfrey Nippert's daughters uh, dying in 1874. And so uh, I think, I can't remember the name, but I think the earliest one was 1872. So I believe that's why we decided to use that as the date that it was established. This once again gets complicated because the date of death on the tombstone is not historically correct. Uh, so it doesn't quite match up with the Nippert side dates. But the first grave down there was George Dorch and uh, the story we have always been, the, the family legend is at least, that he was not allowed to be buried up there with the good Christians on the upper side because he had died drunk. And he had gone over to town, uh, was coming back, fell off his horse and froze to death. And there was a little uh, article that was in a church letter that talks about that. It said, here was a man of great wealth, owned 10 farms and lobbed however much money and another, another victim of the evil vice of intemperance. So they were a little tough on him there, but he was the first grave down on this side. All the McDowells are buried up there. And then uh, my, my mamaw Mandy, who was a Spriggs, all of her people, the Lozers and the Spriggs are all buried. All the generations back to the Dorch sister, Eliza Jane. If you start at George Dorch and go down, 
our generations right on down uh, to, to, to my parents as we're all right there in that row from George to George down. There was also a lot of early industry around here that uh, some of us no longer no longer here. We also have family ties to most of it. You know, we're very close to the Ohio River, so riverboat traffic was was uh, very very important. Uh, my great grandfather, A.J. Andrew Jackson McAllister, uh, he was the father of J.D. Bryson's wife, Nan McAllister Bryson, and he was a steamboat captain. Uh, Fanny Dugan uh, uh, on the Ohio River. Uh, so there's there's a tie to the river industry. J.D. Bryson, uh, my grandfather, who again, once again he was the father of the A.H. who began this business. He was a businessman in his own right. Uh, we have a corporation tax receipt from him from the late 1800s where he had a store business. And part of what he would do was uh, row out to the river traffic on the Ohio River to those boats taking groceries to sell to the rivermen. So there's, you know, there's that, those river ties and business ties there. Uh, the clay mining is in, was, was in this area. We had a tram road that went past. You know, clay mining and brick, brick making is such, has been such a huge economic impact in this area. The clay mines in this area, you know, Schultz Creek way, way back had the, kind of a deep mine. You know, that was but long before we had the equipment for strip mining. The tram road, of course, didn't get up as far as our farm, but now clay mining did, and there's still some clay sites, and they used open pits to uh, uh, mine and load it up and bring it down off of those mountainsides and make it off to Taylor Brickyard. They said Coon Clark drove the dinky that uh, hauled the clay from Al Schultz. It, it, it left the brickyard and went, went up past, uh, uh, went straight out of the brickyard and come up to the hill and round the tram road, round the Tiger Bend, and out uh, over a little white oak there. Of course, our little dinky road that came up through Sunshine and up that way came around your hill here at Bryson's store and Bryson's Curve and went down and up Curly Hunt's hollow as, as I remember. And across Schultz, uh, down about where the old sh original Schultz water grist mill was, apparently was located, crossed there and went on over into uh, Emory Branch or Dry Branch as most people know it and on, and on out through. So we had clay miners, and uh, this industry, pretty well, the clay mining industry on Schultz uh, died pretty early on because Dad would have been, I think, only about five years old when the tram road quit. But he could remember it clearly. And where the track came around across from Bryson's store on that point, it's a real sharp, well, made a real sharp curve in the track. And so the Coon Clark, the nuns Coon Clark, was the engineer, and. He had to slow way, way down to make that curve across the store. So when the boys were here with the tram coming, they'd run up the hill and jump on it and get to ride around the curve when they had slowed down. He said when he'd clear that curve, Coon would make the steam roll. He'd make it come out of that locomotive and the boys would have to jump off laughing. It was a big game between them. Once again, Dad, Dad was a very, very young boy when that all ended. Other ties we have to early industry is that my, my grandmother was Elizabeth Callahan. Her mother was Margaret Barracks and her father was Edward Callahan. Through that family, they're also connected to the Eiferts. And Sebastian Eifert well, would have been, been a great uncle of mine. And uh, he came to this area to build the Boone Iron Furnace and was later associated with other, managing other iron furnaces in the region. Uh, my grandfather, Callahan, uh, was a teamster, uh, worked with the EK Railroad, and uh, if you go to the Honeywell, where that stable is still there, it's really something to think he was in there with his teams. 
uh, that, that building still stands, but he helped uh, haul, haul goods and ore. Um, I won't say what year it was, but I was one of them. I saw 52 spina mules, spina horses, and yoke of cattle from the top of the bank at sunshine to the top of Morton Hill. With one right behind the other. And when they pull them hills, they pull slow. You know, I had to stop and rest. And the way the road come up, the old way, you know, way around this way and through the cut. Now, most of them at that time was uh, tires, cross tires, and lumber, and hook poles. And uh, the, I see, 1902, why the brickyard come in up here and they haul clay. One of the, the draws to Bryson's store is for people who are descendants of George Dorch. This is like the last touchstone. Most of the farms have been split up. A lot of people have moved away. I have been so blessed as I've matured and looked back at what I've been able to experience by growing up on Bryson Farm in Schultz Creek. The ability to appreciate the land to appreciate the people who were here before me, who helped make it the, the place it is today. And I appreciate the fact that I have a reverence for the land. I think that's one of the things we have to be careful to maintain within our country, that you have to have rural areas. You need to have local citizens maintaining our farms, that we are run by Americans for Americans or Kentuckians, run by Kentuckians, run for Kentucky. It is an important place to escape, to see nature, to see the beauty of the sky, the hills, the stars at night, something none of us should ever forget. Mm -hmm.